Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, everyone, for being here. This is super exciting, isn't it? Yay. Um, I, I also want to thank the county and the city for, for really helping the forum to be so successful. They donated a lot of the equipment, and then the city moved it all out of Heidi's at the end of last Wednesday, worked on it again yesterday, and got it all working. And CASA bought a sound system, which so far so good, because I think our number one complaint or I think I asked areas of improvement was to get the darn sound system working. So we're already off to a, a better start in that regard. So like Kathy said, my name is Barbara Bynum and this morning it is my pleasure to welcome Jim Pocart um, from the Colorado River District to talk to us about Lake Powell and how Lake Powell really helps us meet our water obligations under the compact to the lower states. However, um, Lake Powell is at a very low level with the low snowpack that we've been having over the years. So he's going to talk to us this morning about that. In addition to serving as the Community Relations Director for the Colorado River District, um, he is also the Chair of the Colorado River Roundtable. He lives in Leadville and has been working for the River District since 2005, and he has been in Colorado since 1992. Prior to working on water issues, he was involved in local journalism and newspapers around Western Colorado. So let's give Jim a big welcome. Thank you and good morning. So uh, this is the, my third talk in Montrose, and uh, two yesterday, one today. So last night it was at the CMU uh, lecture series, and one of the customers, uh, one of the attendees said, oh boy, you're going to form tomorrow. That's the cranky group. <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> so it's great to be here. And another fellow this morning um, told me that, yeah, there's a big crowd here. And I said, no, is it for the, the new facility? And he said, no, they're all worried about water. And I said, well, they ought to be. And we'll get into that in, in a little bit. So it's really good that there is this uh, baseline concern for water because it's deserved and uh, you'll understand why as we go along. So um, you might be able to tell from my accent that I'm probably from the mid-Atlantic. I was uh, born in Philadelphia, grew up in South Jersey, then known as the Garden State, still is the Garden State, but maybe less so. And then I went to school at the University of Maryland and got into journalism and uh, I did the uh, community journalism on Maryland's Eastern Shore, that's Chesapeake Bay country, that's soybeans, corn, chickens, and uh, some cattle. And then I lived in West by God, Virginia for a little while, and that's what they call it, West by God, Virginia, a beautiful place, when they actually play uh, John Denver's song, you know, West, you know, West Virginia, I won't sing it, but people actually cry, especially in the halftime of a football and basketball game. So then I moved back to uh, to Maryland, back to where I started. Um, you know, this happens in journalism. And so I was working there for a while, and then I finally came out to Colorado 92 to be general manager of the Aspen Daily News. So my accent, um, if I really uh, revert to it, I'll say things like not water, but water. Like we're, and then not, we're not gonna wash the clothes, we're gonna wash the clothes, we're gonna wash the clothes and a lot of water. So uh, I'll, I'll try to avoid avoid those, those kinds of things. But no, you can't put the accent out of the person. I used to go home and listen to my mother talk. I said, Mom, you got an accent. <laughs> then I come back out here and they say, hey, Jim, you got an accent. So maybe West Virginia and rural Maryland and now Colorado's beat some of that out of me. So we're, we're going to talk about um, why Lake Powell is important for each and every person in this room. I probably should get away from that um, speaker. So. Think about if there was not water in the Uncapadre Valley. It'd be a desert. Think about if there was not water development in all western Colorado. Who do you think would be living here? The Utes. Because that's all the carrying capacity of the land had for um, tribes that could move around or lesser in population than we are today. So finally, in the, the late 1800s, and the uh, Anglos came and we started developing water. We discovered that um, with the sunshine, 300 plus days of sunshine, that's just not a tourism thing, it's actually true. Um, good soils and uh, warm weather, good growing seasons, if we can only get water to the land, 
um, we can make it productive. And in this valley, um, that really was that thinking started in the late 1800s. And in 1902, uh, the first reclamation project, the first Bureau of Reclamation project, became you know the Gunnison Tunnel and the Uncompadre Water Valley, Uncompadre Valley Water Users Association, and the whole canal system. That now you have 80 some thousand um, acres of irrigated land here. And it's still productive, and that's important for lots of reasons. But now we're growing subdivisions, and uh, sub subdivisions are on that land, and we really couldn't even have that kind of development or associated economic development if it weren't for the for the foresight of folks back in the late 1800s, late 1800s, and the, and the help of the federal government in 1902 to uh, develop this project. So, why why is it why are we talking about Lake Powell? Well, as we, I'm going to go through a couple slides and I'm going to talk about how at heart we're all snow farmers. We harvest snow and our big silo is Lake Powell. And Lake Powell allows us to use water in this area and in western Colorado against their obligations to the lower basin states in, in poor times. And we've had like 18 years, um, 16 years of poor times in the last almost 20 now. So the silo is getting low. <coughs> We're also going to talk about the dam, Glen Canyon Dam, and how that's important. We're going to talk about the Colorado River District, who, whom I work for and who you help fund. We're going to talk about what's happening in Lake Powell. And we're going to talk about the number one issue these days is the potential curtailment of water use in western Colorado because of Lake Powell's low levels, and we'll look we'll into the explanations of that. But the one big takeaway that I want you to think about as we go through this is that there's two kinds of curtailment that can happen. One would be a mandatory, uncompensated curtailment. And what does uncompensated mean? You don't get money. And if if your use of water is, is a, if your paycheck's dependent on your use of water, then um, if you don't get paid for one season, two seasons, three seasons, you're probably going to be out of business. So that, that's very important. And the alternative to the mandatory curtailment would be a voluntary, compensated, and temporary, and we'll, we'll come back to this. We're going to talk about how we're part of a larger system and uh, in seven states in the Republic of Mexico and, and the law of the river. Now, about the river district. So, in 1937, um, and actually in the 1930s, there was a big push from Front Range of Colorado to develop holes in the mountains to take water from the west slope to the Front Range. And why is that? Um, it's the old 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the water in Colorado falls in the western slope and we had about 20% of the people, it's actually less than 10%. And on the Front Range, they have 90% of the people and about 20% of the water. So all, once mining got going, um, the Denver developed and Ag developed to support mining, so we got the water right system. But anyway, the Front Range took off and it continues to take off. And if it weren't for water going through tunnels, um, Colorado probably wouldn't look like it does today. The Front Range wouldn't look like it does. We wouldn't have the economic activity that we do. We wouldn't have all the culture and universities on the Front Range. But leaders on the Western Slope back in the 1930s, including Judge Dan Hughes from Montrose County and other leaders from, from Mesa County, saw that if there was unmitigated development of trans mountain water, as we call it, and the future of Western Colorado, there wouldn't be one. So um, we, we were formed by um, people who thought there needed to be an irritant to the lakes of Denver water, Colorado Springs, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District, to um, be in the game, to be in the deal, to try and make sure that the West Slope's uh, future was protected. So folks in 15 counties, we cover 15 counties actually tax themselves. It, today the rate is just a quarter of a mil, that's 0.256 of a mil 
to make sure you all have a dog in the fight against the front range water interest and also those um, downstream, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, we're, we are your dog in the fight. So you might wonder about it in Western Colorado, well, we still have Trans Mountain Diversions. You did not do a good job. Well, here's the problem. The Colorado Constitution says the right to appropriate water shall not be denied. So you can file for a water right. It could be very junior. You might only get it one year in 10, but you know that's today. Back in the, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, the, the lesser population, there was more water to be had, and they were filing on projects. So our job was to negotiate the best deal possible um, for Western Colorado. So that's why we have the Green Mountain Reservoir. That's why we have Root Eye Reservoir. This is storage to protect the future of development in Western Colorado. But coming back to Montrose County, why did, why did Montrose County really care back at the turn of the previous century? And that's because for decades there had been talk of a big Gunnison, Arkansas project. So there was a there were big plans to take water out of the headwaters of the Gunnison River and take it over onto the Front Range. So, and that actually, that, that idea um, didn't finally um, die, at least legally, till the early 2000s. But what, what happened is um, there was a lot of dissension. People in the Gunnison Basin didn't, you know, didn't want that project. River District was, was contesting it. And, uh, it finally uh, shrunk to become the frying pan Arkansas project. So water that was going to come out of the Gunnison Basin now comes out of the headwaters of uh, Pitkin County and Eagle County, the frying pan river, the, Ro the Roaring Fork River, and Hunter Creek. And that, that's what the, so that Gunnison project shrunk. So you don't have a trans mountain diversion. However, there was another gentleman who came along who had a big idea to build a, a reservoir up at Union Park. In, in the upper Gunnison and then take the water across the hill. And uh, the upper uh, Gunnison River Water Conservancy District, the Colorado River District, and others um, fought that and we finally won a court decision, uh, it was like 2005, 2006. So you are still without a Trans Mountain Diversion. Lucky you. Now a, a word about our funding. Some of you may have heard about the Gallagher Amendment. It's a, a piece of our Colorado Constitution. And what that does, it um, artificially, recurrently, it's artificially depressing our residential property revenues. And why is that? It's because of growth on the front range of Colorado. So this constitutional amendment says 55% of property tax collections need to be commercial, 45% need to be, be residential. The problem on the front range is that the increase in residential growth is forcing Colorado's ratio to outstrip what's having commercial, and then um, the legislature's on the verge of reducing uh, a multiplier in, in the formula, how we figure out our property taxes. So the River District, as many rural districts, both in eastern and western Colorado, is looking at a cut in funding because of this uh, quirk in the Constitution called the Gallagher Amendment. So. Initially, we were looking at a 15% cut. With that, so about that was about um, uh, 300, 400 some thousand dollars, and we've already reduced the staff by four people. Anticipating that now, now we're thinking uh, the legislature might be saying, "Oh, it's only going to be 100 thousand dollars that we could lose." But we can't be going backwards like that when we're going up against the like likes of Denver Water, 250 some million dollar budget, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy. 300 some million dollar budget. And these are folks, you know, gunning for West Slope water in the past and in the future. And that certainly, I don't need, I couldn't even tell you what the budget of the Southern Nevada Water Authority is or the, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, Phoenix, and all that. So our 4.2, 4.3 million dollar general fund, fund budget, which is about to go down, um, we're, we're kind of worried about that. We're, our board of directors is, is looking at. Um, possible remedies, um, and we, we're already taking reduction in force. So, just putting that out there. Um, that's a story shared by, as I said, many many rural taxing districts that were providing uh, basic services in, in Colorado. Okay. It's it's kind of unfortunate, but uh, we're we're governed by a, a board of 15 members. These are our counties. Um, we're all we got everything from south of the Wyoming border. Uh, the south slope, of, the north slope of the uh, San Juans, and 
the Continental Divide, and then, then the Utah Board of Selling. Um, we have 15 board members, and your board member from Montrose County is Mark Catlin, who happens to be in the legislature right now, and he sends his uh, kind regards. And uh, another personality in Montrose County is your county attorney, Marty Whitmore. Uh, as you saw in the paper yesterday, she's our board vice president, first female. That's amazing, after 82 years. But it's the truth. And, uh, but, and she actually is Uray County's representative because she lives outside of Ridgeway. Okay, so now we're going to paint, paint a broad picture. I told you we're all snow farmers, so how's the crop looking this year? Yeah, yeah, the last year was, was pitiful, and it's actually looking really, really good. Um, the Gunnison Basin got up to 120% with these recent storms. Um, and, you know, I just looked at the weather forecast, and um, one, two, three feet of snow is coming into the San Juans, the, east, the southern tier, um, through, through the weekend. So it's going to keep mounting. Just three or four weeks ago, uh, it was in 70-some uh, percent. Same thing with the upper Rio Grande, and um, same thing with uh, the southwest corner of the state. Anybody who would have seen the drought map from last year would have seen, you know, the darkest, deepest, most concerning colors, you know, in, in, in this area. So this is all a good sign. So as snow farmers, this year's crop is looking pretty good. So we're talk, we've talked about the importance of Lake Powell as our big silo. And here's what 115 snow tail sites above Lake Powell are saying. Um, this is red is this year, and if you, here's the peak last year, so we're way above the peak of last year, and let's hope this red line keeps on um, going on top of the median, which is the purple line or the deep blue line, and that um, our crop is, is truly good. Now, some people might remember about three years ago we had good snowpack, and, and so it appeared, and right about Valentine's Day, boom! It, it turned off, and we actually had had a dry spring, and uh, things turned pretty sad. And that was not a good precursor to what happened last year when um, it was about the third worst year on record. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like um, in, in terms of Lake Powell. So another way to think about Lake Powell too is that in the Colorado River Basin, there's always a drought somewhere. Someone's always doing well. Somebody's always doing poorly. <laughs> It's always better if somebody's in close to 100% and above 100%, which is what's happening this year. And we seem to be on that trajectory um, for all the states. So what's, what states are the headwaters of Colorado River for Lake Powell, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, and, and a little bit in New Mexico? But the preponderance of snowpack comes from the state of Colorado in, in the high elevations above say 9,000 feet. So the biggest reservoir that we have is not actually a hole in the ground. It's your snowpack, your high elevation snowpack. So the, snow, the snowpack's looking good, the crop's looking good, but, but here's a problem that's going to affect runoff. We're not going to get the, the runoff that um, you would think from the kind of snow that we're seeing. And this is a soil moisture map. And the big takeaway here is reds, browns, not good. So what happens with runoff? So when the, the, the solar, you get the solar input, the snow starts melting, it goes into the ground. If the ground is dry, it's going to take it, its greater share of that until it's saturated. And finally, when the soils are saturated, then you start getting accretion to the streams and rivers. So. This is what the last uh, three, four, five years of hot summers have done. And it, they've dried out the soils. You know, th this would be the Uncapadre Valley. You're not been seeing um, soil moisture problems here. These are, the, this, these are the high elevation areas that I'm talking about where the big snowpack is. This is a, way up in the woods, and that's where the big, our biggest reservoir is, the snowpack reservoir is. So the ground is going to soak up a lot of that before we come to the stream. So the runoff is not going to be as bountiful as the snowpack might predict. By the way, on soil moisture, um, 
in, on, in, in the valleys where we're farming and uh, even in you know, the front lawns, you're going to see that emerge um, as something that we'll deal with to make us better users of water. Because the healthier the soil, the more organic the materials that are mixed in with it, the less of the water input is required to produce a lawn or a crop. So, so when, when we think about what's going to happen in the future, you're going to hear more attention to soil science and soil moisture and how to improve um, the health of the soil. In fact, I just saw a flyer um, at Holiday Inn Express where, I'm st where I was staying last night, and you know, there's a snow or there's a soil science uh, um, affair coming up on uh, you know February 21st or 22nd or something like that. So, um, you know, look, if you're interested, get get more savvy on the dates than, than what my poor memory is producing here. So, Lake Lake Powell, our our silo really our barometer of what's happening in the Colorado River Basin, where some areas are good, some areas are bad. So this is what's happened since uh, they closed the Lake Powell, since they closed uh, Glen Canyon Dam in 64. These are the, the inflows that the snowpack has produced. The long-term average is 10.83 million acre feet going into Lake Powell from 1981 to 2010. <coughs> So you can see uh, there's probably more years below the average than above the average. And by the year average, on, by the way, average almost never happens, but it's still a statistical uh, benchmark. But I'll call your attention to some people who might remember 1977. That was a really bad year. 77 was so bad that a lot of the ski resorts decided they had to start making snow. And lo and behold, they did, and um, we worked with water law and snowmaking is now a beneficial use of water. Um, other folks may remember 2002. You know, that, in my experience in, in, in Colorado, that was the bad year. I was living in Summit County, and Dillon Reservoir, we had um, dust devils all over the place. The reservoir got drawn down so low. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and then we had 2012, which a lot of pit folks might remember. That's not so, so long ago. You know, the, only, the only good thing that happened here is 2011 was a big snow year, right? And thankfully, because our reservoirs were in good shape and uh, we, could, we could withstand 2012, but nevertheless, <coughs> anybody's a skier, it's not, it was not a good skiing year. And anybody who was depending on run of the river or run of the creek, on um, water rates that irrigate their land, you know, they weren't happy that, that year either. 2013, you know, wasn't, wasn't even much better. Um, and there, you know, we did draw down reservoirs to 2013, where it was not good. The only thing that saved us was um, in May, we had a lot of moisture. So springtime uh, moisture, so you got the snowpack, springtime moisture, it is also important, so the rains in April and May, it's, it's a lot of times that's snow in the high country. And then uh, June is by um, statistics one of our driest months, as is October, but June is the driest, driest according to the state climatologists. So June always dries out, and if you, you know, it's actually around the turn of uh, summer that sometimes we have our highest temperatures, you know, when the sun's finally the highest. And then the, the next important thing after that is the monsoons, right? So monsoons um, can be a savior. They can uh, help with irrigation, right? Right, Steve? Sometimes, yeah. So uh, you know, last year, did we have great monsoons? No. So you know, on top of poor snowpack, we had um, a dry spring, and we didn't really have monsoons, and we really hit our reservoirs hard. We built them to protect us in years like that, and they worked. But you know they got to recover, so that's why we're rooting for a continuation of of uh, the weather that we're seeing. I'm going to see through this weekend and hopefully into March too. So the Bureau of Reclamation um, makes forecasts. So here's to 2018. You know, again one of the lowest. So this is what the Bureau of Reclamation is forecasting for inflow into Lake Powell. Again, Lake Powell is a big barometer for the health of the basin. So um, the most probable forecast is 7.7 .7 million acre feet in 12 months flowing into Lake Powell. So that's still about uh, 
um, 3 million acre feet below the long term average. And what's more, 9 million acre feet is going to come out of Lake Powell. So if we're lucky, we'll put in 7.7, .7. we're going to take out 9. What's likely going to happen is what we saw this year, Lake Powell went down a, uh, the elevation about 32, 36 feet. And when you're going to still have a deficit of inflow versus outflow, you're going to see it go down. You know, who knows what's going to happen, but if it's another 30 some feet, that's just another sign that we're at risk of these larger issues of perhaps having to curtail water. Hopefully it's not mandatory, but probably the Bureau of Reclamation is going to force us in Colorado and all the states to deal with that before we get to some critical issues, which will, which will go on. By the way, I want to introduce um, your basin's um, member on the Colorado Water Conservation Board, Steve Anderson. And he, he runs the Uncopology Valley Water Users Association. And uh, you know, that's the back, backbone of the county, uh, for two counties, actually. So anyway, so thanks for showing up, Steve. And if I stray off the truth, where I have alternate facts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, the takeaway is that, yes, no packed slippery rate, soil moisture is not good, and therefore we're not going to have the, the recovery year for PAL, Blue Mesa, and, and others where it's necessary. A runoff forecast as of February 1st um, versus the 81 to 2010 average. For this basin, and Blue Mesa, right now the runoff is predicted to be 550,000 acre feet, about 81% of normal. Blue Mesa is 30% full right now. You can do the math, 30% of about 800,000 acre feet. Um, I don't know if, it, probably it's not gonna fill. Because you just can't capture every, every drop of water that would come in, you still have to send some downstream. And you know, eventually, that that's going to be some of that water is headed to the Gunnison Tunnel. So, to Taylor Park Reservoir, I don't have it. Um, is another one. It says Taylor Park is like the, the, the true headwaters for the Capaccio Valley water users, right, Steve? And uh, you know, 81,000 acre feet is predicted uh, inflow. That's about 82 percent of average. Do you think Taylor Park's going to fill, Steve? I doubt Taylor fills. Yeah, so Taylor's probably not going to fill either. Ridgeway is another one a lot of people see, um, especially if you're driving up the year right. Um, what did you see last year when, when it gets real close to the highway? You saw some mud flats. You saw some boats down there in, in the middle. But um, so Ridgeway is expecting 81% uh, or 81,000 acre feet of inflow from the Uncompadre River. And that's about 80%. And I don't know if that's going to fill either. Do you think, Steve, Ridgeway will fill? Ridgeway will come real close. Okay, because it's a smaller, smaller bucket. So I gave you a lot of bad news. Here's the good news. Um, this is uh, above average precipitation predicted for the next three months. So the big A above average and the nice darker green color is above Colorado. So I'm trying to be, you know, a little cheer, a little more cheerful. Um, you know, trying to give you the bad news too. So let's hope that that's true. So now we're going to talk about um, the bigger system, how we're, we're all up on this together. So back back in 1922, um, folks on the river, especially those in Colorado, knew that we had to make a deal on the Colorado River so that. Um, there could be equitable apportionment to the various states. And well, why did that become important? Because in the turn of the 1900s, there's a Supreme Court decision basically that said a water right's a water right. Your priorities your priority. State lines don't matter. So a lot of the senior water rights were being developed down in this area, especially in the Imperial and Coachella Valleys for irrigation purposes. And then, of course, you know, LA was starting to take off as well. In, um, a lot of growth was seen in Phoenix. So um, why would they want to make a deal if, if the Supreme Court says the seniority of a water right matters and state lines don't, why would they want to make a deal? 
Well, in 1906, what happened is uh, there was a big flood on the Colorado River. So there were no dams on the Colorado River in the, in the lower basin. And it wiped out a lot of uh, infrastructure here that was sending water in the, across the All-American Canal into this big um, irrigation area, which, by the way, if you enjoy winter produce, a lot of it's coming from um, right here and also in the Yuma area. All, all irrigated by Colorado River water. So, you know, chances are if you uh, buy a head of broccoli or a head of lettuce, you're ingesting Colorado River water. It just went all the way down there before it came back here. So anyway, their irrigation infrastructure um, got wiped out. So they were thinking, we need flood control. Then there are years, like we saw last year, where the Colorado River does not produce the amount of water that would satisfy all their irrigation needs. So, so last year, the river produced maybe um, 4 million acre feet uh, of runoff. Well, that was happening, you know, early in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, too. So they were saying, well, we need water supply, you know, for the poor years. So they needed flood control and they needed water supply. So what was that going to be? Well, that became what's now the Hoover Dam. It started out as the Boulder Dam. But they wanted Uncle Sam to pay for it. So Uncle Sam says, we're not, we're not paying anything unless you all get along. you got to make a deal on the river. And that's how we got the, night, the Colorado River Compact of 1922, which basically cut the river in half. And i got a slide that gets more technical than that. And the deal with the, the, up, the upper basin states made with the devil was the lower basin gets the better half. Why is it a better half? They get it first we get what's left. And Mother, Mother Nature has proved that um, we will never get our half, except for in the most biggest of snowpack years. So the upper basin's been taking a shortage since about day one. Fortunately, we're not depleting all the water that we're allowed on paper. So that really hasn't been a crisis. So we cut the river in half. They got the better half. We got the, the worse half. And they got federal funding for, for the Boulder Dam which is now the Hoover Dam. Yeah. One other thing to note is that Glen Canyon Dam, which is, became our reservoir to protect our water uses up here, to become our silo, is below all our uses in the upper basin. Lake Mead, the Hoover Dam, is above their uses. They have a water supply reservoir. We have a protection reservoir. Also of note here, we've talked about to Mexico, which had add up to 17.5 million acre feet on paper. Yeah, some people would say that paper is not worth the, what it's printed on, but um, nevertheless, this is how it, it, it got cut up. So here, here are the uses. Um, upper basin, we're only depleting about four to four and a half million acre feet a year. So that's way below seven and a half. Lower basins fully using their seven and a half. They're fully using, if not more, of their um, tributaries. And this evaporation charge um, is actually the big villain in all this. They don't get charged an evaporation charge. Upper basin gets an evaporation charge. So what's evaporation? That's what comes off the reservoirs. Like the evaporation off Lake Powell is worth the size of a Dillon Reservoir, 250 thousand acre feet a year so that's a lot of water going up in the air so um, the subtotal of, of usage is yeah I guess it's around 17 and a half acre, million acre feet but keep an eye on, on this evaporation thing so here's the hydrology Th these are the inputs so we have what 17 and a half million acre feet being used and and here are, are the inputs. So you look at between 2014, it's been 12.3 million acre feet a year. Um, you can go to the paleo hydrology tree ring uh, reconstruction. Was, you know, we're only seeing 12.7 million acre feet a year. And at least between the, the, the period of record that a lot of people reckon with, 1906 to 2014, is 14.8 million feet. However, you, you cut it, um, more is going out, more is being used than, than comes in. So this is what that has done to Lake Powell. It was last essentially full in 99, 
This is what happened after the drought of the early 2000s. It got hammered down to 8, 8 million acre feet by uh, 2005. We made some recovery. Then we had 2012. You know, so th these are all like the top of the top of the chart would be July 1st. You know, peak runoff, right? Runoff's kind of kind of over. Well, look at 20, 2012, that little bump, um, not, not good. And look at the little bump after 2018, um, not, not good. So this is what happened to Pal right, right now, and currently it's just uh, it's approaching um, eight, eight, nine, what is it, a little below 9 million acre feet. That's, that's about a little bit more than a third full. You know, that's... that's, that's uh, Get, getting scary, and that's why we're doing things called drought contingency planning, and that gets into these curtailment scenarios I talked about, where if we're forced not to use water in this area because of, of these issues, which for, foretell compact issues, that can either be mandatory, where nobody gets paid, or it could be voluntary, compensated, and temporary. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But this is what's prompting that. You know, if this was your savings counter stock portfolio, you wouldn't be a happy person. Still, we're going to talk more about the dam. Grand Canyon Dam does more than hold back water. It produces electricity, and that produces revenues. What do those revenues do? Um, they fund oper operations and maintenance of the Bureau of Reclamation projects. They, f they help deliver compact water, so if we get to a level where we can't generate power, we lose revenues, and we won't be able to meet our compact obligations just because the plumbing's inadequate. And that, that foretells compact administration and, and forced curtailment. But what's going to happen is the feds aren't going to um, let this happen, where this is a critical line, 34.9, where we can't generate power. You can see how some of the projections, how close they get. Bureau of Reclamation is going to step in, hopefully with a plan uh, volunteered by the states, whereby um, we'll take actions, drought contingency planning, to f for, forbear our use of water to support lake power levels so power generation can continue. So um, what, what do those uh, power revenues at Powell um, help with? Well, it's just not operations and maintenance. Um, a lot of it goes to environmental programs, like the Upper Colorado Endangered Fish Recovery Program, which um, has great bearing here on the Gunnison River, the main stem, and um, even the San Juan River system. And, and in the Yampa, it allows water development without and, um, Endangered Species Act consultations. Um, all you have to know is that it would be a nightmare for water users to have to go through that process. But um, some, of the, some of the programs that funds are the, the salinity program. So what, what happened in 1970s Mexico, which we signed a treaty with, said, hey, we're getting salty water. You know, it's damaging our crops. It's, it's untenable. Let's, you have to do something about it. So the United States said, okay, we'll do something about it. And they created the salinity program and using revenues from power generation at the dam. And so the salinity program has had great bearing in this valley, as um, Steve, Steve knows, you know, over the years, what so millions of dollars have been put into the ground with piping and uh, other other improvements, modernization of infrastructure. But um, just just this year, um, this is what this looks like. We have 5.3 million dollars coming from the salinity program. Another 1.3 million dollars coming from the farm bill, and. Um, about three hundred thousand dollars with others skin in the game, including the Uncompahgre Valley water users. So six point nine million dollars hitting the ground here in in uh, in Uncompahgre Valley, thanks to the revenues from from the dam. So uh, those the, those revenues have a bearing here and and across the West. This is just a little reminder of the importance of. Uh, the Uncompadre project, the Gunnison Tunnel, it opened in 1909. President Taft came, it was a big deal here in Montrose. And a lot of people, uh, you know, what's left, what they see of this legacy is just driving down the road, you know, here's some irrigation infrastructure, here's a green field. And, you know, this is kind of the grassroots. This is what this project means um, to this area. This is how water gets, gets the properties. 
So now we're going to talk about drought contingency planning. What, what are the states going to do about it? There's a handout in the back that, talks, that contains this. You can take it home. So the lower basin is very empirical. They know when meat gets to certain levels what the cuts look like. And Arizona right now is sweating bullets because um, they take the preponderance of the cuts and modeling on, uh, on of late meat says that in 2020, unless we have some biblical improvements in runoff, um, Arizona is going to start taking cuts in, you know, there. It, what, what, what we're seeing happening down there could be a window of what could happen in Colorado where agriculture is, you know, a lot of it's going to take the first hit and they're wondering what they're going to do. And one of the cruel ironies is they're looking to go back to groundwater in Arizona. Well, one of the reasons to have the Central Arizona Project in 1992 to get water to Central Arizona was their overuse of groundwater. So what's old is new again, and a lot of them might go back to groundwater. California is the biggest state, but it's the smallest here because of, of their higher priorities on the system. They don't take cuts until the, the lake um, crashes through about the third tier. So California is in a fairly good position. What we have up here is the upper basin's uh, drought contingency plan. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to cloud seed even more. We're going to try and create more more snow by seeding clouds with silver iodine. And the only problem there is you need clouds to seed. Last year we didn't have clouds. This year it might be working. We're going to go after uh, what's known as phreatophytes, tamarisk, Russian olive. They're invasive uh, water hogs. You know, their they're problems along uh, the riverbanks, they're taking over. We're going to work harder to eradicate um, them. And then finally, from a, a major water perspective, um, when it's possible, like it wouldn't be possible this year with Blue Mesa, but we're going to move a slug of water from Blue Mesa, Navajo, and Flaming Gorge down to Pal to protect those power generation levels. So if that doesn't work, what are we talking about? We're talking about demand management, which what the Colorado River District advocates and the Colorado Water Conservation Board is advocating is that demand management be temporary, compensated, and voluntary, and, not, and we want to forestall mandatory where nobody gets paid. So right now, though, this is just a plan to make a plan, and a lot of work has to be done. When you think of the demand management, uh, utilities do it all the time. Um, they do it with their rates. It could be encouraging people to run their dishwashers washers and dryers in off hours, and not between, like, you know, 7 in the morning and, and 5 at night. And in some cities, uh, there's brownouts where they ration electricity, and uh, you know, I guess your air conditioner turns off uh, for a couple hours, so and the lights go dim. So you know, that's what demand management looks like. It's the forbearance of use. So now we're going to talk about um, demand management sideboards, voluntary, temporary, compensated. Why? Again, you don't get paid. If it's mandatory, you don't get paid. And what I think will happen is that if we get to that point, it'll be the start of a wholesale change of water rights ownership in Western Colorado. And we might not like what, what that looks like. Who's going to chase that water? It's going to be the cities with big checkbooks. They're going to want to augment their junior water rates. And there'll be a time when they actually then have to take the water. You know, we've seen, seen this with the energy industry up in Garfield County where energy uh, interests bought up uh, ranches. They're, they're still on ranching, but those water rights, if oil shale ever booms, um, they're going to be converted into, um, you know, industrial production. So um, we don't want to see West Slope agriculture, irrigated agriculture, which is important. Irrigated agriculture is important to the environment, it's food security, it's de facto open space, it's work, pretty working uh, landscapes that we see as we drive down the road, it's wildlife habitat. How many herds of deer and elk have you seen on irrigated ground? It's a good reason, it's like a salad bar. And for, furthermore, in lots of, lots of parts of Colorado, these senior ag rights are pulling water down the rivers and the streams, and we're fishing on that water, we're playing on that water. So if that water gets repurposed, let's say in some parts, if it starts going east, 
Um, there's going to be fewer, fewer molecules in the river, and you know, so we're all interests are going to be affected. So if we lose irrigated ag, recreation, and the built environment that we've created will be affected, and we won't like what that look, looks like. So a lot of people will say, well, hey, um, they said in the compact that um, water rights perfected by 1922 are safe. And, and indeed they, they could be, but here's another thing you have to think about is that a lot of reservoirs that support use of those 1922 water rights are junior to the compact. They're post-1922. So if you can't fill a reservoir because we're under compact administration, you know, your 22 water rate is going to be as good as the run of the river or the run of the creek permits. So um, if you have a 22 water rate and you're dependent on reservoir storage, um, th think about that. If you depend on run of the river, that's still worth something, but that also might make you a target for um, purchase. And maybe you don't want to purchase. So, as everybody knows, water rights are like property right. They can be purchased. You can sell your consumptive use. But we, you know, and we're not talking about changing that. What we're talking about are those who want to stay in ag. We don't want them um, forced out of ag by these kinds of forces. And we're really talking about the whole West Slope landscape being, being the basis of that concern. We don't want the landscape to change. Another factor, um, if we lose irrigated ag, uh, is return flows. So what are return flows? Especially when you have flood irrigation, but otherwise also return flows are what um, the water that runs through the ground and eventually comes back to the creeks and the rivers in late summer and fall. These support baseline flows. If you go back to the 1860s before we developed the river systems, um, yeah, you had a big runoff. And by the end of the summer, uh, streams and creeks were down to a trickle. Nowadays, uh, the, the late summer and the fall winter base flows are higher because we've changed the environment, we've made a built environment, and that, that water we put on the ground is working its way back to the creeks and rivers, and that's important to wildlife and other, um, for other reasons as well. So, here's a pie chart. These are depletions of the, in, of the Colorado River and the Colorado River Basin. Blue is agriculture. This, this is uh, West Slope uh, municipal use. East Slope, Front Range use of Colorado water. East Slope, municipal use of Colorado River water. Because all these factors I've talked about, they see how big this pie is, this section of the pie. They're looking this way. There's a big target on West Slope bag. Yeah. You know, initially we thought uh, West Slope Bag was, um, you know, we, we, we know West Slope Bag is about 1.355 million acre feet of depletions, and we used to think about 1.1 million acre feet of that was um, pre-compact, pre-1922. Um, round tables come out of River District and um, the Southwestern <coughs> uh, Water Conservation District and Durango are doing a risk study. And one of the findings that just came out, Steve, is that um, actually depletions from pre-compact rates be as high as 1.5 million acre feet, which in my mind um, puts even a bigger target on West Slope Bag that makes this piece of the pie look even better. Here's Lake Mead, not looking great. So take away here is that in um, 2020, this is a modeling by the Bureau of Reclamation. They're going to be at the shortage criteria. So um, they're just around the corner um, in Arizona. Pay attention to what's happening in Arizona and California and Vegas because it's a window of what could happen up here. And all these things I've talked about, um, potential curtailment or voluntary forbearance, how's that going to work out? You need money, you need administration, and, and it's going to be a big political um, issue. Um, one thing I want to point out is that the, one of the policies of the Colorado Water Conservation Board and the River District and others is that if it comes to forbearance of water voluntarily or otherwise here in Colorado, that we do it equitably, which means this piece of the pie shares some of the pain. So you'll hear about 
sharing the pain, and uh, you know, they're saying the right things on the front range right now that they're willing to share the pain. Let's hope that's true. But bottom line, because of all these reasons, we don't want West Slope agriculture to become the sacrifice zone for poor planning by Colorado.